So previously we've been working off of mainly the definition uh, that Ernst Mayer laid out known as the biological species concept. And we really focused on that concept because it allowed us to develop those reproductive isolation mechanisms because his biological species concept was really tied into the idea of interbreeding and producing viable and fertile offspring. Now we have to remember that there are actually other definitions of species and we're going to entitle that next flowchart just that. Um, there are three other definitions of species that you should understand that uh, do play a role in terms of figuring out how a species becomes a species, how we define it. So we'll say other definitions of species. Okay, Other definitions of species. Um, so we have a biological species concept rooted on interbreeding, the ability to interbreed and the ability to produce fertile and viable offspring. We also have um, a much simpler, many people consider, morphological species concept. And this one's a little bit different. So we'll say morphological, let me rewrite that, morphological species concept. And in this concept, we look at the morph. Morph means shape. We look at the morphology of an organism. Simply speaking, we're going to distinguish and classify and sort of compartmentalize species uh, by their shape. We're going to distinguish species by body shape. And this is a thing that a lot of people do intuitively almost. When you see two different things that look different, that actually just physically look different, you think they are two different species, two different animals. And that's true. You distinguish species by body shape or um, even other structural, let's say, features. Other structural features. And what's good about this species concept is that it actually applies itself and can be applied or it can apply to both sexually and asexually reproducing organisms. This works for both, okay? And it can also, and we can say, be applied to fossils. And this is simply because you can see fossils, you can see and project and predict the shape of that organism and the structural features that that fossil organism had at one point. You can do the same thing with a prokaryote, you can see its shape and its structural features. You can do the same thing with a eukaryote that's sexually reproducing. So it's a very powerful species concept that's a good uh, underlying way to look at a species altogether. Um, so we can move forward now by looking at a different species concept that's called the ecological species concept. And we'll do that one over here. So it's called the ecological, ecological, let me rewrite that. This is called the ecological, ecological species concept. So a bunch of species concepts. In the ecological species concept, we're not going to define a species by its shape or its structural features or its ability to interbreed and produce fertile and viable offspring. We're going to define a species by what we call, so we'll say define species by their respective ecological okay, niche or niche. Okay, Define species by specific ecological niche. This is simply referred to and understood as how members of a particular species, so we'll say how members of particular species, um, how these members interact with the living and non-living environments that they're within. Interact with living and also their non-living environment. So when you see an animal and you see how it reacts with, let's say, the prairie that's with, that it's within, or how it reacts within the grassland that it's within, how it reacts within, let's say, things like um, the food that is present within its environment, or how it reacts with things like the time of day, you know, when does it forage, when does it mate, those are all ecological concepts, how it, um, let's say, relies on hunting patterns. 
those are ecological things that it does. That's a non-living thing. The idea of hunting is just a, it's just a concept, and it falls under the ecological species concept. And even things like the response to temperature. So we'll say temperature responses. Does this animal run? Does it hide? Does it um, you know cuddle up? Well, how does it react to its environment essentially? And that's what we mean by the ecological niche. If two things have nearly the same identical ecological niche then they are, by definition of the ecological species concept, a species because they follow the same food patterns and time patterns and hunting patterns and responses to temperature, etc. Um, another thing about the ecological species concept is that it can also um, actually apply to all. And when I say all, I'm just saying that for sake of brevity because I don't want to write this again. Um, it can be applied to sexually reproducing organisms, asexually reproducing organisms, and even fossils. Fossils because we can look Looking at fossils, see how certain things and what type of food things ate. Uh, typically, we can see how the hunting pattern was. Many different powerful things can be seen through fossils. One thing you cannot see through fossils is what? You cannot see the ability to interbreed, okay, because these things are no longer living. And thus, the biological species concept developed by Ernst Mayer way back in our first flowchart is something that cannot fulfill this fossil role nor this asexual role that these two so far have done. The last type of uh, species definition that we can look at is another very powerful one called phylogenetic. So this is actually, a, you're going to have a whole lecture on phylogenetics, but this is called the phylogenetic species concept. Okay, Very easy names to remember. The phylogenetic species concept is a definition of a species. So we're going to define a species, but specifically this is going to be by what we call the smallest group of individuals, okay, smallest group of individuals that shares a common ancestor. So this is actually going to be a definition that's going to be worked off of in great detail in the next lecture entitled phylogenetics. But for right now, just understand that when you look at a phylogenetic tree, you're going to define a species specifically based off of that tree because the species will be specifically from just one branch. It will be one branch of that phylogenetic tree. One branch um, phylo tree. One branch of phylo tree. So if you have a phylogenetic tree and you have these uh, branches that are coming off of it like this and you have, let's say, another sub-branch and then another sub-branch here. Um, this right here, let's say number one and then number two, one is going to be considered a species and two is going to be considered a separate species because it's the species from one branch of the phylogenetic tree. This one branch right here that I'm circling is a species. This other branch that I'm circling is also a species. That's what we mean by the phylogenetic species concept. It's based off of a lot more than just branches. These branches are defined by evolutionary history and common ancestry. Those are things you're going to learn in the next lecture. But just be aware that there are other ways to define species that are actually better in terms of fulfilling the asexual and fossil limitation that the biological species concept had. And so we would use these type of uh, concepts when necessary. That's the power of uh, macroevolution. You can use the species concept necessary at the time. And speaking of macroevolution, we're going to further our discussion on that topic of broad scale change by further looking at more specifically speciation in the next couple of videos.